All right, folks. Well, my plan for tonight is to answer questions you have about the material that's going to be on the first exam. So as a reminder, the first exam covers five chapters, one, two, three, four, and five. There are 66 questions total, and it's multiple choice, and it's exactly the same format as the quizzes and the post tests that you've had on Canvas. In fact, it's administered on Canvas. So you have to go to the testing center, but they're going to put you in front of a computer. You're going to log on to your Canvas account. You're going to click on the exam, and then it will ask for an access code, and that's when the testing center people come and type that in, and then it's exactly like taking a quiz, just longer. Um, the important things to know, the differences between the exam and the quiz, aside from the fact that it's in the testing center, is that it is, um, it's memory only. There's no notes. You can't, you can't look anything up on the web. You can't bring any notes. You, it's, it's all from memory. So that's going to be different. Also, um, it's hand calculations. I mean, you've been doing your calculations by hand anyhow, but just to make that clear, you can take a calculator, right? Um, you can take any kind of calculator you want except your phone. And you'll want one because you're going to have to do square roots uh, in the process. So you can bring scrap paper if you want. You can bring five sheets of scrap paper, and you'll want some because you're going to have to write numbers down and, and work the equations, and that's a lot easier if you can write it down. So bring a pencil, bring a calculator, and just remember to get to the testing center while it's open. Uh, double check the hours of the testing center because it keeps different hours on uh, Saturdays. Sometimes it keeps funky hours on Fridays and Mondays, sometimes. And remember, the hours that they advertise usually mean when they close the doors. And that means you can sneak in just a minute before that and they'll give you the exam, and then you have one hour uh, at which point they kick everybody out. And since most people finish this exam in like 30 to 45 minutes, uh, that's enough time. Anyhow, you guys all know where the testing center is? OK, good. It's about three miles away from here, yeah. Did you, have you put a time limit? No, there's no time limit. Okay. Just 66. Yeah, so it's a little bit longer. I wanted it to be 50, but I, was, I got too enthusiastic and I put too many questions on it. But um, Now, just as a reminder, the second exam is longer. It has 80 questions. And the first 20 of those are essentially repeats of questions on this exam, where I, I make small modifications, so the numbers are a little different. And they're the 20 hardest questions. So once you take the exam, you can get back onto Canvas on your own computer and you can see what questions you missed. Count on those ones coming up again. And then for the final, that is longer. It's 97 questions and it covers all 12 chapters uh, evenly. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, so you can access the exam on Canvas afterwards. It, I think it will tell you which questions you missed, but I don't think it will tell you what the answer is. But, right, you can see the questions. Right, so you can see everything afterwards. And, you know, that meant if you were a really conniving person, you and a buddy could, you know, arrange for one of you to take the test and then come home and you could both look it up and the other person could ace it. But I, I don't, don't do that, okay? Um, not that it necessarily hurts you. Um, I don't grade on a curve. But, you know, it's not nice. And I'll mention two other things about grading that will probably affect you. The first one, which actually does not usually impact the first two exams, is that if the highest grade that anybody get, the highest non-outlying grade is not 100%, and, and by the way, I do this separately for my online class and for my hybrid class. But if the highest non-outlying score is not 100%, I pick the whole distribution up and I add enough points to make the highest one 100%, okay? 
By the way, it means if there's an outlier, they might get like 112 or something. But usually that doesn't happen. Actually, it never happens on exams one or two because there's always somebody who gets a legitimate perfect score and the distribution is high enough with a lot of scores in the high 80s and the 90s that it's not an outlier. So, but for the final, I can guarantee you this adjustment will happen. When you take the final, the adjustments have been usually around five percentage points, but as high as 15 percentage points. Um, so you take the final and you get, you know, like a 72 and you're crying your eyes out. And then it turns out that you actually get an 80 uh, when I count in the grades. So probably won't happen with exams one or two. Almost certain to happen with the final. <laughs> the other thing that can, that can help is if you take exams one or two and you don't do as well as you hoped on them. And I know that sometimes the first exam you take with a teacher, there's a little bit of just like figuring out the format that they use. Now that shouldn't be much of a problem for this course because it's the exact same format as the quizzes and the post tests. I wrote those and the exams at the same time and just kind of threw the question either onto the quiz or the post test or the exam. So it's the same, similar. Um, but if you don't do as well as you hoped on either of those exams, if you do better on a later exam percentage wise, I'll replace your earlier score. So let's say you take the test next week and you get, you know, a 72. But you take exam two and you get an 81. I'll replace that 72 with an 81. And then if you take the final and you get a 94, I'll replace both of those with 94s. And because each exam is 20% of your final grade, that makes a big difference. Okay. So just be aware of that. It's, it's a form of grade forgiveness. The one condition for this is that you have to have actually taken the exam. You can't skip it, and I don't replace zeros. I'll replace a 5%, but I won't replace a 0%. Okay. Anyhow, so that's that. And don't forget the exam for you guys is available right now. It's been available for four weeks. Um, it's available right now and it's available until Monday, October 6th, right? So that's rest of this week, all of next week, and then the Monday after it, okay? So do yourself a favor and don't wait until the last moment. I People always get like flat tires or their baby gets sick or something horrible happens and they can't miss it. And unless you have like a serious, like you got hit by a truck or something, um, you may not be able to make up the exam, okay? All right, so that's that. Um, so what I wanna do now is I'm, I'm planning on being here until about eight o'clock, although I do have a rule. If there's a 30 second pause, we're done. All right, but I'm planning on being here for about two hours. And what I want to do is answer questions, okay? So I'm only gonna do stuff, I'm only gonna talk about stuff that you ask me to talk about. Also, I want to do it in order. So we're gonna spend the first, you know, 15 minutes on chapter one. And then we can do stuff from chapter two, then three, then four, then five, all right? And then if there's any time left, we can go back and answer anything that got, you know, skipped the first time around. So. Let's talk about chapter one. Do you have any questions on the material? Could you explain about the normal, ordinal, medium? Yeah, the levels of measurements, the big thing in, in that chapter. Okay, I'm gonna use the document camera. And so let's see. Okay, so what you got is, there we go. All right, that's what I get for looking down while I'm writing, okay? Okay, you got nominal and then ordinal, then interval and ratio, okay? And they're normally put in this order with nominal on the bottom and ratio on the top. And the reason for that is because nominal is considered the lowest level of measurement that contains the least amount of information. 
and ratio is considered the highest because it contains the most information. Here's how it works. Nominal means name, right? And all it tells you is, if, imagine that you put a number in. So you give a, a one person a one and another person a zero on something. Even though you've given them a number, when it's a nominal variable, that is standing in for a name or a, a category name. So for instance, if I'm analyzing data and I've got a survey and there's a question on there about gender, I always enter it as zeros and ones. And so let's just put that down here. Oops. It just indicates category. And you could just as easily write the name of the category. Now the, the reason you use numbers is because some statistical programs are a lot happier when you put numbers in. And you can tell it that a zero means this and a one means that. Uh, that's called a value label. But um, the program likes it better when you put in numbers because then it can use it to do uh, certain procedures on it that require numbers like correlation and regression and stuff. But if you have a nominal variable, and remember, nominal means name. It's Latin for name. All it indicates, the number simply indicates a category membership, like male or female, or the state that you were born in, or your social security number. That's an interesting one because the number is a category, but it's a category that consists of one person, just you. Whereas the other ones are much larger groups, right? So nominal only indicates category. There's no order, there's no amount, it just means different from each other. Okay, so ordinal is above that, and the reason it's above it is because it includes the category information, but it adds order, okay? So you guys know that the ordinal numbers, that means first, second, third, as opposed to the cardinal numbers, which are one, two, three. And so with ordinal, the number indicates that a person is in a category, but that category comes before another one, or it has more of something than another one. And so you can rank them. This is rank data also. So the best example is, you know, the Olympics, you get a gold, silver, and bronze. And you know, for instance, who was the fastest. And you know who was the second fastest and the third fastest, but you don't know their times. And you don't know how far apart they were. You only know that this one came before, this one came before that one. Because, you know, sometimes in the Olympics, it's a thousandth of a second between first and second, or it can be, you know, a huge amount of time. All you know is that this one came before that one came before that one. And now, well, there actually is a kind of measurement here because you have to say who has more of something or who comes first. Because you aren't able to say how far apart they are, you can, indicate, you, can, you can indicate the order, but you can't indicate the distance between them. Because you can't indicate, indicate the distance, these are usually treated, the, the two of these, nominal and ordinal together, are treated as categorical variables. And what that means is we generally do the same kind of statistics with the both of them. Chapter 12 in the book is about a test called the chi-squared test. That's one that we do with nominal and ordinal data. And you do bar charts and pie charts with nominal and ordinal data. So the same kind of analyses, the same kind of uh, charts for the both of them. On the other hand, these other two, interval and ratio, you do other kinds of analyses and other kinds of charts. And so these two tend to get grouped as categorical, and these two tend to get grouped as quantitative. Okay. Now, some people call this qualitative and call this quantitative. There's a couple of reasons I don't use that. Number one, it's really hard to even tell those terms apart when you hear them because they're so similar, qualitative, quantitative. Second, qualitative data, to me, means something different than simply saying a yes, no on a particular category. To me, quali qualitative data is a lot like a person who's doing in-depth interviews and case studies or an anthropologist who does an ethnography. That's qualitative data, and that's very, very rich data. It takes an enormous amount of training and experience to work with it. And simply saying, you know, yes, no, or what category are you in, you know, that to me doesn't cut it. So I just call it categorical. Okay, interval is the next one up. It contains the category. See how everything's going up? It contains the category 
And it contains the order, because you can say who's got the most or the least or the first or the last in something. But its major addition is, you can call it a couple of things. You can call it either distance or measurement. And what this means is, now you not you know not only who comes before the other one, you know, first, second, and third. You not only know that, but you can actually say how far apart they are. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but I guarantee you, it, when you're doing a uh, statistics, it makes an enormous difference because being able to say this is the size of the units and this is how far apart first and second are, it helps a lot. And you guys know, especially like, um, I mean, you know, you recall a few years ago when we had the Occupy Wall Street movement and when you're looking at income, most of the people are, are sort of way down low and then you get this curve, at, well I should draw it this way, and you get this curve, and you get these people up here, and you say, yeah, this person makes more than this person makes more than this person makes more than this person. But by the time you get up there, the difference in ranks can indicate like 10,000 or 100,000 or a million dollars between these two people, whereas down here it's going to indicate like, you know, a dollar and a half. Because the size of the difference makes, you know, it impacts it. And so that's what interval tells you. Now, the important thing about interval is that it does not have a meaningful zero. It may not have a zero at all. So for instance, if you're doing a questionnaire and you ask people to rate their agreement on a scale and you go from like a one to five or one to seven, there's no zero at all, right? Now, technically, you can argue that uh, a strongly disagree to strongly agree scale is an ordinal scale. And some people say that it should be treated as such. I have never met a single researcher in my life who treated them as ordinal scales. Every single one sort of backed up, closed one eye, and pretended that it had these set units between the one, the two, the three, four, and the five. Because that makes life so much easier. And especially when you're averaging across a lot of different questions, the differences sort of average out. Um, but there's no zero. Now, you could set it so there is a zero. You know, if you have a one to seven, you can just change it to zero to six. It's got the same number of points. Or you could change it for, to minus three up through zero to plus three. It's got the same number of points. And while those two have a zero, it's not a meaningful zero because it does not indicate the absence of something. It's an, and the, the term here is it's arbitrary. You can stick it wherever you want. You can stick the zero at the high end, at the low end, in the middle. Um, any of you guys ever done audio engineering? Eh, probably not. But if you deal uh, with decibels, it's almost always measured in negative numbers. So zero is at the top, and then you go negative down from there. It's the only thing I know that's usually measured in negative. Um, you can measure it in positive, but it's almost always described in negative. Um, and so you have the zero, but you put it where you want. It's arbitrary. And it may not have a zero at all, or it may be there, but you can shoot right past it, or it just indicates, you know, pick a starting point somewhere and make that zero. Okay? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. So you're asking in an interval scale, do you give like a label to every number that you, you can? You can. You don't have to. Um, I mean, for instance, here's, here's a, a familiar example is, is temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit. That's an interval scale because you know exactly how par, far apart every degree, every degree is the same step away from each other, but there's a, there's a zero in both of them, but you shoot right past it. It just represents a starting point. So, you know, zero in Celsius means something. Water freezes there, right? But you can go below zero. If you live in Minnesota, you go below zero. But I have no idea what zero in Fahrenheit means. You know, water freezes at 32, and I don't, I, so I don't know where the zero in Fahrenheit comes from, because you can go right past it. It's just sort of like this, you know, again, it's like somebody threw a dart and said, that's zero, and let's go up and down from there. And it's just also like calendar systems, you know, for instance, that um, our calendar system, we start, you know, 2,000 years ago, but if you're using a Jewish calendar, we're in the year like 57, you know, 100 or something like that. And if you use the Nepali calendar, we're in a different year. They all pick a starting point. We're going to start counting the dates from here. 
and they pick something that's meaningful to them, and it's going to be a different point for each group. And so that's, that's the significant thing. Okay. So that's interval. And things like temperature and things like maybe a scale where your people are rating it on a 1 to 5 or 1 to 7 scale, those, those would be classical examples of interval. The other choice is, is up here at the top. It's ratio. And ratio has all the stuff the other ones have. It, it indicates category and it indicates order. And it indicates distance, because you know how far apart the scores are. But what it also has is a true zero point. And what that zero point is, is it's a meaningful zero that indicates the complete absence of the thing that you're talking about. Okay? So in temperature, Celsius and Fahrenheit are interval because they have a zero, but you can shoot right past it. But if you've ever done physics or chemistry, you know that there's, you can measure a temperature in degrees Kelvin. That has an absolute zero. That indicates the absolute lack of metabolic activity or uh, molecular activity. And then it just kind of goes up from there. Height and time, length, weight are also good examples of ratio. Now, I've had some people say, well, you, you know, like height can't possibly be a ratio because you can't be zero inches tall. That's true. You cannot be zero inches tall, but that's the starting point. That indicates the absence of height, and you go up from there. And remember, you can't have a negative height. And the, 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 the real giveaway is any time that it's reasonable to say this much is twice as much as that much, then that, that's making a ratio, right? You say it's a two to one. Six feet is twice as much as three feet, right? But 80 degrees is not twice as much as 40 degrees. What it is is 40 degrees hotter, right? But it's not twice as much temperature. But eight feet is twice as much as four feet. Now, an interesting, an interesting one about all this is money. Because in, in a certain sense, Money is ratio. You start at zero, you go up, and a thousand dollars is half as much as two thousand dollars, right? It makes sense to make those ratios. On the other hand, you can be in debt. You can have a negative income. You can have a negative value, and um, so I don't quite know what to make of that. And the other thing is, you guys are in the behavioral sciences, most of you. Um, money is experienced psychologically on a um, on a logarithmic scale. And, and that means it, it rises quickly, but then it tapers off. And once you get to a certain amount, to feel, to feel twice as rich, you have to have a whole lot more than twice as much money. Um, and so th there's really interesting stuff about the psychology and the sociology of money that is very separate from a measurement issue. But it's true. The number 20,000 is twice as big as the number 10,000. That's always clear, right? Uh, and so in that sense, it's, it's ratio. So that's the big difference. Yeah? So then what comes to the interval or ratio? How do I measure Okay, ready? It depends on how you're measuring it. Kelvin is ratio. Celsius and Fahrenheit are interval. They're all measuring temperature. But Kelvin starts at a meaningful zero. Celsius and Fahrenheit put their zeros over here and over here, you know, which are partway through the scale. Um, by the way, there are several other methods for measuring temperature, one of which is exclusive to um, milk. But you can go look it up. Um, anyhow. So, and the funny thing about it is, you know, you like to think that, like, age is always ratio, because you start at zero and you go up, and, you know, 40 years is twice as old as 20 years. But it's not always true, because a lot of times you just say, is this person older or younger? You know, for instance, um, maybe you're married or dating somebody, and there's a big question always is, which of you is older? And I'll tell you, for instance, the fact that my wife is older than I am, um, that, you know, that's an ordinal statement, but it's a very significant ordinal statement. You can also, so I just bumped right down here. I can also say how big the difference is. And, you know, so you can say, for instance, that, you know, you and your significant other are two years apart. And so I know the distance between the two of you without knowing your actual ages. 
right? That's interval because you've now specified the distance between the two people without giving me an absolute reference point. And finally, when it comes to nominal, um, we sit down occasionally with our kids and let them know that there is a super hard and fast line at 18 years old uh, where you are legally in a minor or an adult. And you have to be very, very attentive to that line. Similarly, there's a, is it 19 years old for tobacco in Utah? I think it's 19 and it's 21 for drinking. Um, and it's 18 for, it's 18 for voting, right? And like 26 to rent a car. And so you have all these cutoffs. And those other, those are nominal um, treatments of age. Okay, are you over or under a particular category? Okay. This is a big one. It's going to come up on every exam. Okay. And it, it matters because, it, again, it changes what kind of graphs you make and the kind of statistics that you can compute. Ordinal and nominal, you do frequencies and you do percentages. You don't usually do means or standard deviations. Ratio and interval, you don't do bar charts. You do histograms and box plots. And you do, and you do means and standard deviations and correlations and regressions now. I say usually because there really are funny ways of working with data uh, to sort of hack it into something else depending on your purposes. But those, those are the most common approaches. Yeah? You make bar charts or pie charts? Because those are indicating category membership usually. Now, it's true that you can also make a bar chart that indicates the average for a category, and that's sort of a different thing. But if you're in simply indicating, like, you know, how many people there are in each major here at, at UVU, that's going to be a nominal variable where you're counting the frequency in each category, and you'd make a bar chart. And for ratio and interval, you have bar chart. Yeah, ratio and interval. Um, you wouldn't make a bar chart because, remember, a bar chart has, here, watch. A bar chart has space between the bars, right? So let's say you got, you know, three bars like this. And that's A, B, and C, right? Well, maybe there's a reason to put them down as A, B, and C. For example, um, one is... If you're counting the number, of, well, let me, let me not let me not say that. Maybe there's a maybe there's a meaning to this order, and it needs to be that way. So if you're putting like gold, silver, and bronze, you you would want to put them in that order. On the other hand, if you're looking at like the number of uh, the percentage of college graduates in each state, yeah, you could put them alphabetically, but it would make a lot more sense to rearrange them you know, from highest to lowest. And so this would be, you know, whatever state has the most, and this would be whatever state has the least. So it's not alphabetical anymore, but they're ordered by something else. See, with a bar chart and with a nominal variable, you can rearrange it however you want. Um, I know some programs that will actually let you rearrange a bar chart based on a statistic that's not even in the chart. So you might want to look at uh, the number of college graduates, but uh, arrange it by... Um, average high school um, GPA, okay? And so you're actually showing an association there with the bar chart. And that can be helpful, um, as long as you're clear about why it's sorted that way. But, so that's the thing about bar charts. You can sort them however you want. So a nominal variable, yes. Ordinal, you usually want to keep it how it is. But with a histogram, um, with an interval or ratio variable, there's a meaningful order to the numbers, and it needs to stay there. And so those ones, you always chart them from like lowest to highest, and you, I do histograms and box plots always for both of those because they tell you different things about the two of them. Yeah, a histogram, new paper. A histogram, you know, you can draw it like this, right? Whoop! There's my little bell curve, and that's kind of like a histogram. But if you do it in a statistical program, what it's really going to do is look like this. And so you see how those bars are all pushed together? Whereas when I did this one, there's space between the bars. But here they're together. 
That's an important thing. That's a, that's on a bar chart they don't touch. And the reason they don't touch is because the order is arbitrary and you can move them around. But on a histogram they touch because they they represent adjacent values and they need to be that way. Okay? What's also interesting about a, a hist if you draw a histogram like this, the width of this little of each bar that's called the bin width. It's like how big is your bucket that you're throwing numbers in? Because you can make your chart skinnier. You know, you could um, you could draw it. You could draw really narrow bars and have a lot of them. Um, it, truthfully, that gets really cumbersome. When I do these, I usually draw it so there's either like five or seven bars total, because I'm trying to summarize, and that makes it easier to see an overall pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's do, oh, you know what? Let me just do one more thing. Is there anything else from chapter one? Oh, so uh, could you make an example about the radio interval in the box? The, the, how do we plug it in? To the box plot or the, yeah. there is no difference. There's no difference. The only difference you're going to see there is that one of them has a zero and the other one doesn't. But otherwise, they work exactly the same. And the computer program's not going to care which one it is. You just put it in there and it'll make it. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. Time. Well, okay. Time, okay, so the question is, is time interval a ratio? Time is almost always measured at the ratio level because you start the clock at zero seconds or zero minutes or years, and it goes up from there. You have a meaningful zero that indicates the absence of the thing that you're talking about. Plus, you know, somebody who takes um, four hours to run a marathon has, takes twice as long as somebody who takes two hours. And, and that's a ratio. You know, it's a four, four to two. And so time is almost always a ratio. The interesting, there's an interesting exception to this. Um, it's not really an exception. It's just that if you ever watch um, like bicycle races, they will often report intervals. And they do the same thing in car races. They'll give the time for the leader. And then they'll say, you know, and, and they'll say plus this many seconds for the next person, plus this many seconds. And so you, you know, if you don't have the leader's time, you don't know what that person's time is, you just know how far apart they are. And you know, if it's the Tour de France and it's three weeks in and they're still and they're just three seconds behind, you know, they can catch up. But if um, if it's at the very, very beginning, you're gonna have a problem. The other place is golf. They, they tell, give you the number of strokes for the leader, and they say, you know, like, plus two strokes, plus three strokes for the people after. Those, and, and those are called intervals. Uh, and so the time intervals. So you're just saying, you're taking your starting point as the leader's time or the leader's score, and then you just say, how far away are they from that? That's an interval. And, and that is literally an interval level of measurement, because you're able to specify the distance between the scores without positioning them exactly on um, on the scale. So time, but time is nearly always ratio level because it starts at zero and it goes up. The same thing is true of length and height and weight and age. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a little hard to come up with examples of intervals because they're 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 usually artificial because nearly everything, if you can count it. It's almost always a ratio. Um, intervals really just kind of come up in this artificial measurement world, um, like a, a one to five scale, or in physics where you just kind of chose where to put the zero on Fahrenheit or Celsius. But anything that you're counting, you know, like zero, one, two, three, that's almost always ratio. What was that one?
Okay. The okay. What did you put for that one? You know what? Send me a message on Canvas. I'll give you credit for it because you can make a very good argument that a rating scale like that is ordinal. I mean, because you know it says this person agrees more than this person, right? Um, it's just sort of like in the practical world of research, it's treated as interval. And it's, and it's treated as interval because we assume that one and two, the difference between one and two is the same as the difference between four and five because it's one step. And that's really hard to show for a single question, but it's, it's pretty easy to show for like 20 questions, again, because the differences tend to average out and it sort of stabilizes. Um, but you don't, you call it an interval because even if they had a zero, something, sometimes uh, people put it as you know, a zero to six, the zero is not, it does not indicate the complete absence of agreement or, or something. It just indicates one end of the range. Um, but put a message on Canvas and I'll give you credit for that one, okay? okay? By the way, that's true in general, folks. If you feel that you deserve credit for a question, let me know if you can make a good argument. I'd, I'd say about half the time I'll give credit for it. And the other half of the time I'll say, no, I specifically addressed that in the, in the book. But um, you can always ask, right? <laughs> you know, it's an important lesson. I, we have my, my daughter in the sixth grade. She's getting her grades back. Weird things are happening. And so it turns out the teacher's confusing her with another Zoe in the class who talks all the time. She, she got marked down for talking. No, it's the other Zoe. Um, anyhow. Okay. Chapter one. Better move on. Chapter two. Chapter two includes the distributions, right? So when we did the box plots and the stuff, that is in chapter two. So let me come back to the question you had about, somebody had a question about box plots or histograms and I can't remember what it was. What was it? Yeah, I think it was uh, how to plug it in. Uh, the oh, okay, ready? Yeah. The answer is it doesn't matter. Here we go. So, for instance, let's say you're, you're um, let's draw our little distribution here. Do, 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 do. And that's what a distribution would look like if you did it with a computer program. By the way, Excel doesn't do these, which is really weird. Excel doesn't do histograms and Excel doesn't do box plots. And that's kind of crazy making because that's the single most common numerical software in the world. I wish they would do these things. They're, they're, they're kind of hacky ways to do it, but it's not built in. Yeah? Kind of, sort of, sometimes. Yeah, it, it, well, what it, what it has to do is it first takes the numbers and then it creates a table off to the side and then, and then it just draws a bar chart with no space between them and it puts things on. That's sort of cheating. Um, it, it, it's okay, it, it, just, it just puts stuff on there. Okay, ready? Here's the deal. Let's say we're looking at strongly disagreed to, and this is strongly disagreed down here, whoop. And this is strongly agree up there, right? One, two, three, four, five, I got a six point scale. Well, maybe this is a one and this is a six. So that's interval, right? But I could also be putting number of kids in a family. And I could have it like from zero to five. So this one is interval but this one is ratio. It doesn't matter. The, the chart looks exactly the same. It's just what numbers are you writing on the bottom. So, and that's, that's why I often, I, I just call interval and ratio, I, I collectively call them quantitative, because almost anything you can do with one, you can do with the other with no modification. Similarly, with the nominal and ordinal, almost anything you can do with one, you can do with the other without modification, which is why I lump them together as categorical. If you're going to be a professional statistician, you're going to use special statistics for ordinal data, but it's a huge pain in the rear. And it takes some very sophisticated programming, and we're not going to touch that one. You probably wouldn't even touch it if you took stats in grad school. Um, anyhow. Okay, what else from chapter two? Okay, ready? X. X is nearly always values 
or scores on your variable, right? Because we're talking about a univariate distribution. That means one variable at a time. So we're looking at the values or scores on the distribution. So something like level of agreement or number of kids or time spent uh, doing homework each week. That's the thing that you're going to chart here across the uh, bottom. So that's the x-axis. It's the variable that scores on the variable that you're looking at. And if I say scores and values, those mean the same thing. So like number of kids, three means three kids. That's a score on number of kids, or it's the value you have on number of kids. Up this side here, though, is frequency. And this means zero people to the maximum number of people within that category. So for instance, this right here, um, this bar might represent the, the score of three on whatever it is that we're measuring. And what I would do is I'd go up here and go do, 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 do over the side, and I'd see, like, for instance, that's a 12. And that would mean that there were 12 people who got a score of three. So in a histogram, by convention, the values or scores on the variable go across the bottom on the x-axis, and the frequency, which indicates how many people have that score or are in that bin, goes up on the, on the uh, side, and that's the y-axis. There are variations on this, but that's the most common way of doing it. Yeah. Another? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, ready? Four charts. Let's begin with the charts that we use for nominal variables. Okay. Two kinds of charts are common for nominal variables. One is a bar chart. Okay? And a bar chart's easy. You guys know these. It goes like this. You're indicating frequency here. You've got the names of your categories down here. And the height of the bar indicates the number of people in that category. You know, so again, take an example. Um, if you look at the colleges or schools at UVU, there's like eight of them, and you can put down the number of students in each one. So for instance, um, behavioral sciences in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, it's an enormous college. In fact, my department, behavioral science, is bigger than two of the colleges on campus. So you can simply indicate how many students are you know, have a major in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, how many are in the, the College of Science, how many are in the School of Business, and, and so on, right? And so that's a bar chart. And a bar chart is really nice because it's super easy to read. And that's the single most important thing. Yeah, I'd say that's, that's really the most important thing for a chart. Is it easy to read and understand? Because the point of a chart is to communicate something in a simple manner. Because you could give them a table of frequencies, but those are a pain. I mean, you ever try to look, you know, we hate tables. Um, the other choice you have is a pie chart. Yeah. Hmm? How many people are in that college? Yeah. And so that's just free. And you can report it as either the count, there are 8,000 people in this college, or you can report it as a percentage or proportion. You can say that this is 12% of all UVU students. Um, the bar would be the same. What you would be changing is just how you mark the numbers on the side, right? right? And sometimes the frequencies are helpful. Very often the percentages or proportions are, are better. Yeah? You can use the same number to do a huge No. Because this is a categorical variable. And so I'll, I'll show you in just a second, okay? Pie chart, another very common chart. Pie charts, you see them a lot, and maybe you have a job at a place where they have a standardized PowerPoint format. And you know what? 
if they have a template that you got to use, you do whatever they have. You know, if they got something goofy, you just do what your job requires, right? And if they have pie charts, fine. But the problem is pie charts are usually very hard to read. If, if you have only like two categories, it's really easy to tell this one's bigger, this one's smaller. But the thing about pie charts is to read a pie chart, you have to be able to do two things. Number one is you have to be able to read the angle. So you guys tell me, how big is that angle right there? And it's more than 45. It's like 75 or 80, maybe. I don't know. Let's get out the protractor and check it out, right? It's, it's hard to tell exactly how big it is. The other thing is, a lot of times for pie charts, not only do you have to be able to judge an angle, you have to be able to read the area of a segment of a circle. And that's really hard to do. There's intuitive calculus in there because it's an irregular shape. And so the fact that you really, people are bad at judging angles. If any of you are planning on becoming an orthodontist, the entrance exam to orthodontic school, you, you have to, I mean literally it has things like this. What is that angle? What is that angle? What is that angle? And you have to know that that's 82 degrees and not 90. Because, you know, that's what orthodontists do. They adjust angles. And so you've got to be able to do it really well. Um, it's, it's an excruciating task. So pie charts are generally really hard to read. The other trick about pie charts is your categories here need to be mutually exclusive. People can only fall into one of them. Or it adds up to more than 100% and that, that's stupid. You know, if I make this, the, if this one is left-handed people and this is red-headed people and this is people who ride bicycles and, you know, somebody can be in all of those. And I end up with this sort of foolish pie chart because a pie chart intuitively communicates proportions. And if a person falls into one, more than one category, the proportions are misleading. A bar chart does not have that restriction. You can have, you know, a person might fall into every single bar and that's, that's fine. You just have to indicate that. You have to make it clear that that's what's going on. But a pie chart is based on the assumption of mutually exclusive categories. So, ready? Here's what most researchers say. Never do a pie chart. As a matter of fact, um, I, I revised the textbook and I use this very fancy graphing software. It's, it's, it's you know, big professional stuff it refuses to make pie charts. It can do like anything in the world except a pie chart. Um, I tried to make a pie chart once with it and you have to do it as a bar chart that's set on polar coordinates. It was, I had to give up, it was impossible. So I just used Excel, Excel makes pie charts. Um, so those are for nominal variables, right? Okay, now let's scoot this up and talk about, I'm sorry, I should not be saying nominal here. I should be saying categorical. Because you can do these for ordinal variables as well. I, okay, so I apologize for that. All right, now let's come down here and say. So that is for nominal variables. Correct. Quantitate. Can't spell. Okay. Quantitative. A quantitative variable means interval or ratio level. And the two kinds of charts that we do most frequently for those are box plots and histograms. You guys know what a box plot looks like. You got your, you got your variable X, which might be age or income or, you know, white blood cell count or something like that. And you've got a box here. that indicates the range of the middle 50%, right? That's why that's called the interquartile range. It's the middle 50%, the low score for the score for the bottom of the middle 50 and the score for the top of the 50. This right here is the lowest non-outlying score. There actually are no outliers on the low end the way I drew it. This up here is the highest non-outlying score and then I drew two other outliers over here. The nice thing about box, and by the way, there is no axis up the side here because the only thing we're indicating here, it goes across left to right. The nice thing about box plots is they're really, really good for finding outliers. That's what I use them for. 
because it draws little asterisks and circles when you have an outlier. It's super obvious when there's an outlier. That's nice. So I, and outliers really have a huge influence on data analysis. It's, you're really shooting yourself in the foot if you have outliers and you're not aware of it. It's because it's going to distort everything. Okay. All right, the other kind of chart we make for quantitative variables is the histogram. Now, the difference between the box plot and the histogram is that this one represents scores on an interval or ratio variable. And you can make the, the bars wider or skinnier if you want to. That's, again, that's called changing the bin width, and you can do that. Um, so this might be a score of 1, and a score of 3, and a score of 5, and a score of 7, and a 9, because we're, each one represents like a range of two scores. So this is 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 5 and 6, 7 and 8, 9 and 10. You can do that if you want. And the variable here on the side simply indicates how many people are in that range. So again, you got to come over and read it, and you know maybe it's like you know, 1,450 people are in the five to six bar. Yeah. Yeah, that's that right there. Yeah, this, this is Q1 and Q3. The mean doesn't show up on this because this is an, it, what's it, this is an ordinal chart, okay. which is kind of funny because, okay, so ready? Technically, you can do a box plot for ordinal data, but it's going to be the stupidest looking box plot you've ever seen, and there's no point in it. But you can do it because this is, an, this is based on, you have to order the data first. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just weird. Yeah. Um, Okay, good. The box would actually be exactly half the distance of the entire chart. It, it, it would just tell you, here's the middle. You know, if we're counting in order, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, sure. here's the middle, here's the bottom, here's the top. You know, and I'm really, yeah, no uh, yeah, there's no outliers and there's no point in it. Okay, so histogram. This is for interval and ratio. You cannot do this for categorical variables. Because remember, categorical variables, things are separate, and the order can get shifted around. These ones, you can't shift around the order. I had students do that once. They, they heard me talking about if you have a categorical variable, you should, you should and you do a bar chart, you should have it go from most common to least common, because that's usually easiest to read. So they took the variable of number of kids in the family, and they, they did it as a descending bar chart. And it went 2, 1, 3, 7, 2, 1. It was, it was ridiculous, so I told him to fix it. But um, because there's an inherent meaning, there's a, there's a, you need to keep that variable in the order that it comes in. Um, so that's because the number of kids in a family is a ratio variable, and it needs to be charted in this particular way. And so you do a histogram and not a bar chart. Okie dokie. What else? Yeah. Can you go over how you find the outliers? And yeah. Okay, ready? You don't have to do this. <laughs> but I'm going to show you anyhow. The interesting thing about it is it shows up, it, I use it when I calculate exam scores. Here's how it works. Let's say you have a distribution. X. In fact, let's call it exam one scores. Okay? Here's what's going to happen. So down here is 0, and up here is 100, because that's the percentage range for the, for the first exam, right? The distribution usually looks like this. Somebody's going to get 100%. And then the first quartile is going to be like, the distribution is going to be kind of like this. So let's say that's around, you know, 90, and there's 80, and there's 70, and I didn't draw it to scale, okay? Um, and then what we have is we're going to have, the scores are bunched up on the high end because most people who take the test know what they're doing. But you get a lot of people in there who kind of forgot to study or ever read the book or watch the videos, and they're seeing the stuff for the first time, 
and so their scores are kind of going to be way down here. Here's how you get figure out who the outliers are. This thing right here, this box in the middle, that's Q1 right there, and that's Q3, and this is the interquartile range because it's be, that means between the quarters, right? It's the range or the of the middle 50 percent, the difference between the highest and lowest score in the middle 50 percent. So you get that interquartile range, you multiply it times 1.5. So if it's this big on its own, make it 50 percent wider like that. And then what you do is you take that distance, one and a half times the quartile range, and you stick it on the bottom of the box. And anything below that will be an outlier. Similarly, if um, you know, I could take that distance and put it on the top, but you see somebody would have to have like 120 before they were an outlier. That's usually true for exams one and two. Actually, it's usually true for all of the exams. It's very unusual to have a high outlier on the exams. I almost always have low outliers because most of the distribution is up high. Okay. Nope. Nope. But it, it's just so you know, it, it's really not that. It, I know it sounds like this big process here, but just think: take the box, make it 50% larger, tack it onto the bottom and the top. Anything past that's an outlier. And the really nice thing about that is, how many of you had? How many of you had Math 1040? Okay. Did I tell you the most unusual statistic? People who took Math 1040 that has no association with their grade in Behavioral Science 3010. To me, I think of them as the same class twice in a row. And the fact that you know the one appears to have no impact for better or for worse on the grades in the other, that's a very strange thing to me. And so it really makes me wonder, what if you took Math 1040 you know, two semesters in a row, would you get the same grade? Or would it be, you know, with a different professor, right? Maybe things would be all over the place on that one. Anyhow, maybe some of you did take Math 1040 twice in a row, but anyhow. I know I have people who've taken Behavioral Science 3010 more than once. Okay, yes, sir. Okay, you're going to need to know this is a box plot. It indicates outliers. That's an outlier over there. This is the median. Okay? And this box indicates the middle 50%. You need to know that it's for quantitative data. You need to know that um, this is a histogram. And it's also for quantitative data. You need to know that that's a pie chart. You need to know that that's a bar chart. And that these are for categorical data. Now, beyond that, there are some other things you need to know. They get into our Scrabble words for this chapter. Ready? Although, actually, these words are too long for Scrabble. You need to know. OK, ready? What's the difference between this and that? Unimodal, bimodal. Remember, mode uh, means most common. And unimodal means it has one most common score. It's got a one peak. It's right there. Bimodal means you have two distinct peaks. Now, bimodal distributions don't happen real often on their own uh, unless what you, as I, I say this in the book and stuff, usually when you have a bimodal distribution, what you really have is two unimodal distributions that got stuck together, like the height of men and women or the... Um, the weight of two different species of dogs, you know, breeds of dogs. Yeah. Uh, the unimodal and the modal distribution is the same. No. I'll show you why. Ready? What's that? Not normal. Oh, um, positive skew. Thank you. Positive skew. And what's this? Negative skew. But you know what else they are? They're both unimodal. It's got one peak. So, so they're unimodal, but they're not normal. Okay? 
Yeah. So, and the one in the top is to say that it's normal distribution. Yes. And is unimodal. Correct. The, the normal distribution is always unimodal. Okay, ready? Here's our little chart. <laughs> this is all unimodal distributions. There's all normal distributions. It's a, it's com all normal distributions are unimodal, but not all unimodal distributions are normal. That's unimodal, that's unimodal, they're not normal. But if it's normal, it has to be unimodal. Yes. So a uni so this is, n this is positive skew, this is negative skew, this is zero skew. Because there's a statistic called skewness, got a formula. And if you run the, the, these numbers through the formula, you'll get a value close to zero. But this will give you a positive number, and this will give you a negative number. Okay? And you guys know if we talk about skewness, you guys know what's next, don't you? Kurtosis. Okay, ready? Kurtosis is not something that comes up very often except on our exams. Well, all right. Kurtosis, to a certain extent, if you guys have had calculus, it has to do with sort of the flexions in the, in the curves. That's not a very helpful, but listen, here's how it works. Ready? You've got right here a normal distribution. That has a skew, excuse me, a value of kurtosis of zero because the normal is the reference point. This is one where they had to pick a place to put zero and they said, let's do it on the normal distribution. They could have done something else. There are other distributions, but this was a reasonable starting place. So that has a value of kurtosis for zero. Again, there's a formula for it. You run the numbers through it, this gets a zero. On the other hand, you can have a distribution that looks a little more like this, a little more like a hat or a turtle or a platypus. Um, and that one has a negative value of kurtosis. You guys remember the word for this one? It's got a name for the shape. Yeah. Platycurtic. It's, it's Greek. Platy means flat, like a, a flat-tailed platypus. Okay. Platy means flat, or platter, right? Platter is flat. And this one is pretty flat across the top. You can also think plateau, right? The normal distribution, do you remember what it's called? Yeah. Mesocurtic, and by the way, the curtic part, curt in Greek means bulge or curve. And so this is a flat bulge or a flat curve. That's the platycurtic. This one here, this meso just means middle, like Mesoamerica or mesomorph. Now, I've had some people get a little screwed up, and they thought that it was mesa, like mesa, and, and this looks like a mesa. No. It, no. Plateau. We're talking about plateaus, not mesas. And in the third choice looks like this. And this one has a p positive value. Yeah, what is it? You're very close. What you are thinking is leptocurtic. And lepto means skinny or thin. So it's a skinny or thin bulge or curve. Okay? And you can see that, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah. By the way, please note these are all unimodal. And the way I've drawn them, they're all symmetrical. They don't have to be symmetrical. You can be leptocurtic and asymmetrical if you've got this big peak off to the side. Now, I do want to, here's the one thing that really matters. This is, the, most of the time, these don't make a difference. Except for there's an, one element of a leptocurtic distribution that matters a lot. And it's not that it has like these strong defined peaks. What it is is leptocurtic distributions have lots and lots of outliers. And again, as I've mentioned before when I was talking about box plots, outliers are huge. You 
have to know whether you have outliers because outliers are going to distort your statistics. They're going to they're going to wreak havoc with it. You have to know that they're there. And a leptokurtic distribution has a lot of outliers. Conversely, a distribution that has a lot of outliers is going to be leptokurtic. Even even if it's like this. You know, so that's skewed. But the fact that we got all these outliers over here, I guarantee you it's going to have a positive value for kurtosis if you did it. But more than anything, it's the presence or absence of outliers that's important. This one has almost no outliers. The platocurtic has almost no outliers. A, a mesocurtic normal distribution has a few outliers, not enough to matter. But this one has a lot, and they're big, and it's a problem. Okay. Leptocurtic. I know it doesn't look real pointy, but because we got these outliers trailing way, way off here, it's going to give it a positive value for kurtosis. The outliers, the outliers they're they're going to make the distribution leptocurtic. Yeah. Remember, that's, that's, and that's the most important thing here. It's the presence of outliers. Yeah. No, no. I can draw any of them skewed. Oh, yeah. Of these ones, those are all symmetrical. They're all symmetrical, unimodal, but you can draw any of them skewed if you want to. Um, one, two, and three. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you put the, uh, the, positive, the positive skewed, like a uh, leptocurtic? Hmm? If it's negative skewed, it's a leptocurtic. Yeah, because lepto, because kurtosis, kurtosis is a measure of shape, right? And this shape can be characterized as both skewed and leptocurtic. It, it's just, again, it's like saying that um, a person is um, both tall and wide. You know, it, it's fair to say both because it's, it's two different dimensions. And they can be high on one, low on the other, low on one, high on the other, you know, and vice versa. And the same is true here. Skewness and kurtosis are separate things, although I can also tell you that if a distribution is strongly skewed, it's going to also be leptokurtic because it's going to have outliers. So you can't get away from that. Okay. Did you had one? Yeah. Yeah. Ready? Here's my attempt. Oh, shoot, you said lepto. Oh, yeah, that's easy. Yeah, it's just a little asymmetrical. And this stuff happens all the time. Yeah, it's, it's not skewed enough to matter, and the kurtosis isn't far enough off to matter. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still be mostly mesocardic. And you had a question. Okay, normal. This is where I show you something that you do not have to know. Ready? Normal means this. That's normal. And that describes that shape. So normal is something very specific. And, this, and actually, this is the simpler version of the formula for the standard normal distribution. Yeah, it's symmetrical. It has, it has a very specific degree of flexion as it comes in and out. Um, and the, the, what's nice about it is because the normal has this very, again, you don't have to know this one ever, right? Yes, it is. Um, I'm, I'm just letting you know that it's not just any one hump distribution, okay? It's a very specific distribution. On the other hand, anything that looks vaguely like a bell curve, you can call it normal without getting in a lot of trouble. I mean, if you want to take an advanced statistics course, we can talk about something called the Cauchy distribution, which looks normal, but actually is because it's, it's peaked in the middle and it's, it looks pretty symmetrical, but it, it's a really weird one that actually has no variance um, or standard devi deviation defined. 
because it has ex incredibly uh, thick tails, jillions and jillions of outliers. But anyhow, so normal is a very specific shape. And the nice thing about it is, especially when we get into chapter six, you'll see that the normal distribution, and especially the standard normal, which means the normal that is, has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, the standard normal is what we use for probability. It's the, it's the simplest probability uh, formula thing that we have. And so we use this for our inferential tests. When we get to things like the t-test and the z-test and chi-squared analysis of variance stuff, we will make references to getting probability values, or p-values they call them, from the normal distribution. And if you've had Math 1040, you know about that. Yeah. Um, for example, if you, if you, if you like have said uh, which uh, distribution shall one be normal or normal, what is the correct answer? It's not going to ask you to choose between those. Oh, okay. It will ask you, it'll say something like, is this bimodal, leptokurtic, mesokurtic, or skewed? And of those four, the only one that's correct is mesocurtic. Right? Yeah, let's close the door. Thank you. Okie dokie. All right, we're an hour and 15 in, and we've gone to chapter two. Uh oh. Uh, any questions? I'm just going to say we're done with two. Any questions about chapter three, which is where we talk about measures of central tendency, the mean, the median, and the mode? Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna head it off and tell you something right now. What I'm gonna ask you guys a question. What is the lowest level of measurement that you need to compute the median? What's the lowest level of measurement? that you can use and still compute the median. Okay, ready? I'm going to give you an answer. It's not nominal. It's ordinal. And the reason for that is because the median is an ordinal statistic. Remember, to do the median, the very first thing you have to do is you've got to take all your numbers and put them in order. So if we have data that looks like this, That's going to give you some real trouble because you, I, I have people who go like, oh, well, the median is halfway in between, therefore it's 2.5. No, you have to put it in order first. And in this case, you know, halfway between 3 and 7 is 5. So the lowest, level of, the lowest level of measurement for the median is ordinal. Although, again, it's the sort of thing like that's so obvious you're not going to do it anyhow. What's the lowest level of measurement for the mode? What's the lowest level of measurement you can use and get a mode? Nominal. And the reason for that is one def the definition of the mode is the most common score. And if you have a bar chart, it just means what's the tallest bar? What's the biggest category with the most people? That's the mode. Now, we're used to talking about the mode as the high point in a distribution, but it's also the tallest bar in a bar chart. So, that's, so you can do the mode with anything. Right? So we have to order first. Not for the mode. For the mode is the frequency. Yeah, the mode is the frequency, and you can do that with anything. So that can work with nominal or ordinal or interval or ratio. But the lowest one, the, the mode requires nominal or higher, or really any level of measurement. The median, on the other hand, you cannot do it with the nominal because there's no order in that one. The median has to have ordinal or interval or ratio, but ordinal is the lowest. Okay, what about the mean? What's the lowest level of measurement for the mean? No, well, okay, you know what? That's not the answer that's going to get you credit on the exam. Although I can tell you, in the real world, I do means on... 0, 1 nominal variables and ordinal variables all the time. You can do it, and people act like you're not allowed to do that. Say, well, a phi coefficient, which is a correlation coefficient, is, that's just using means on a 0, 1 variable. So, but we're going to ignore that. We're, interval. It's 
interval. It's interval because you have to know how far apart the scores are. You have to be able to measure distances. And as soon as you can do that, you can get the mean. And you can do that with an interval. Because again, you don't have to know exactly where it is positioned in real, you know, sort of in the absolute scheme of things, but you have to know how far apart the scores are. So you need the distance, you need the measurement. So the mean, okay, ready? So here's, let's write a little table here. Oops. Mode, you must have at least nominal. And that actually means that any level of measurement works. Median, you must have at least ordinal, which means anything except nominal, right? And the mean, the lowest you can use is interval. So interval or ratio. Or, put another way, quantitative variables. Yeah, interval or ratio. Exactly. Yeah, and that's why I drew it earlier where it was nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio, because you're going up. So anything can do the anything can do the mode, but only those can do the median, and only those can do the mean. This is very nice paper, by the way. Um, okay, what else? Okay, we are, oh, I'm gonna ask you guys a question. Ready? Here is our very familiar normal, distri normal distribution. Ready? Where's the mode? It's right there. It's gonna be smack in the middle, right? Where's the median? Same place because it's symmetrical. In any symmetrical distribution, the median is going to be right in the middle, and it'll be in the same place as the mean, as long as uh, it's symmetrical. And, and where on this one is the mean? Because it's symmetrical, the mean, the median, and the mode are all in the same place. Okay? Isn't that convenient? Um, on the other hand, if the shape were to change a little bit, so for instance, here's this. Let's say this is a perfectly symmetrical bimodal distribution. Where's the mean? We're assuming it's perfectly symmetrical, even though I didn't. It's right in the middle. There's the mean. Where's the median? right there in the middle because it's perfectly symmetrical, right? Where's the mode? Mode is off to either the left or the right. or it's the same. Because it's symmetrical, they're going to be the same height. So we're going to have two modes at the same height. So this is one where you see the mean and the median. If the distribution is symmetrical, those are in the same place. But the mode can shift around. And that actually is one reason why some people say that the mode is actually not a measure of central tendency. Because it can shift off to really weird places where the other ones are more stable. Okay? Um, but let's try this one. Where's the mode? Yeah, it's the, it's the high point, right? That mode's easy to find. It's just the high point. So we drop down, do, 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 do. That's the mode. Where's the mean? Yeah, the mean, so here's some outliers, right? The mean follows the outliers. So let's say the mean is up here. And where's the median? Yeah, it's usually in between the two. So, by the way, what kind of, what, what's the shape of this distribution? Yes, positively skewed. So in a positively skewed distribution, the mean will have the highest value and the mode will have the lowest value. 
Now this is important because some people get a little screwed up and they hear me say, which measure will have the highest value? And they say, well, that must be the mode because it's the tallest. That's not value, that's frequency. And I know that sounds like splitting hairs, but they refer to different directions. Value is the left to right, is the scores that you have. Frequency is how common is that score. So the one with the highest value means the one that's furthest to the right on the distribution. Okay, let's flip it around just for a moment. Okay, what do we have now? Yeah, it's negatively skewed. Where's the mode? Yeah, it's the high point right there. Mode, where's the mean? Yeah, it's going to be down a little bit. And where's the median? Yeah. Median. And so in a negatively skewed distribution, the mode has the highest value and the mean has the lowest. By the way, I have to let you know a little thing. Um, the one mean that's probably really important to you guys right now is your GPA. That's a mean, it's an average. Um, but the trick is, most people, the distribution of GPAs is like this, it's negatively skewed. Most GPAs are like, you know, somewhere in the threes. Because you know, for instance, if you're below two for more than a semester, you don't get to come to school anymore. Um, and so most GPAs are pretty high. And let's say you're motoring along and you've got like a 3.8 and then you take, you know, a really hard class and you get, let's say you fail it. You know, even if you're a senior, even if you have like, you know, 80 credit hours behind you, you know what happens if you fail a single class? It's going to, that one class is going to pull your GPA down sometimes to the point where you'd have to go to school for like eight more years to make it up. Yeah, it's a horrible thing. Um, and so a single, because most GPAs are high, because the distribution is negatively skewed, most of the people are at the high end, a single bad grade can pull your GPA down more than a single good one can lift it up because it's asymmetrical, which is actually is one reason why I personally believe that course grades should be assigned not on means but on medians and the GPA should be assigned based on the median and not the mean. Because you tank a single class, it's not really going to affect your median. It can, it can wreak havoc with your mean, but it would not change the median. And I think the median is probably a better representative of what the person is like in general. If you really wanted to, uh, a lot of statisticians use something called a trimmed mean. There's something like, for instance, called a 20% trimmed mean. You take the 20% highest scores, throw them away, the 20% lowest scores, throw them away, and you take the 60% that's remaining, and you average that. And it actually ends up usually being pretty close to where the median would be. And you know, truthfully, I, I think that would be fair to do with uh, GPAs. But nobody's listened to me on that one. I would love to. Although, you know, in one sense they do, because, you know, when I applied for grad school, I had to calculate my GPA three different ways. I had my overall GPA, which I have to tell you it sucked. It was a 3-3. Three, three. And I know in the overall scheme of, scheme of things, that does not suck. But if you're applying for a PhD program, that's not so hot. But that's because I had a different major for my first three years in college. I switched, I switched to psychology as a senior. Um, and I, you know, I had a 199 my first year. Things did not... What's that? I did. I did industrial design and I had to completely repeat my first year. Yeah, I didn't go to classes. It was my first time away from home and I, I celebrated by just sleeping until two... I was at BYU. There, there was no... <laughs> I was just staying up late and saying, is anything happening? No, nothing is happening. Um, so my, my overall, my cumulative is 3-3, three, three, not so hot. But I also got to report my last 60 credit hours and, and my major GPA. And since I did my psych GPA in two years, I took five years to graduate, and that GPA was like a 3-9. Um, and it was on the strength of that GPA and my test scores that I got a really fabulous fellowship to a school in New York City. Yeah, that's great. 
It's called the City University of New York Graduate Center. It's a PhD institution only, and I got a four years tuition and a, a living stipend that allowed me to live in Manhattan. Yeah, it was great. Anyhow, so that's one sense that's almost like having a trim demean because it says let's ignore the first couple of years and let's just look at the other stuff or the things that matter the most. Yeah. So for going back to the bimodal one, you were talking about that if it's symmetrical mm -hmm. in the middle. Then yeah, if then it's the totally the symmetrical from if if it's totally symmetrical, the okay. mean and the median are going to be the same place. Okay. And by the way, don't forget one of the interesting things about the mean. And this, I, I, have to, I have to always say, this is not a metaphor. This is literally true. If you cut a distribution out of a piece of wood, all right, the mean is where the balance point would be. Mean. The, mean, the mean and the balance point are the same thing. Oh. So if this were a piece of wood that actually had weight, the place where it balanced is where the mean would be. And, and so that's literally true, not just figuratively. And so it would just be, for the bimodal, just the mean and the median that would be the same, and then the mode would be? Yeah, and the modes, you've got two modes, and, and they're going to be the same height if it's totally symmetrical. Okay. And again, so that's why you talk about maybe the mode isn't really a measure of center, because it, it's shot off in both directions. OK. <laughs> I think it is time to talk about the standard deviation and the variance, because that is universally the thing that people are most concerned about for the first exam. Am I correct? Yeah. yeah. If I just had one question on the first exam and it were calculate the sample standard deviation for these data, if that were the only question on the exam, would you pass? We should try that. Just one question. One standard deviation. Can you do it? Okay, let's do this. The standard deviation and the variance are two of the most common measures of variability. And that talks about how spread out the scores are, right? They're not the only ones because there's the range, which is just the difference between the maximum and the minimum. So like if you're looking for an apartment, you can say, well, what's the ballpark for this area? You know, I say, tell me what the highest and the lowest is so I have some idea what I'm dealing with. There's the interquartile range, which is still sort of a ballpark, but it's for the middle 50%. It tends to be much more stable. But the, the, the range is essentially useless as a statistic because it can get thrown off so easily by outliers. The interquartile range is really nice, and the quartiles are nice because they tend to be stable. And if you have some open-ended scores or some undefined scores, it's not a big deal. And it tends to work well. The problem, though, is the interquartile range doesn't really do anything except tell you where the outliers are. It's, and it, that's sort of its major use. It doesn't lead into many other statistics. But the mean, excuse me, the standard deviation and the variance figure prominently in nearly every other statistic we're going to talk about the entire semester. They go into z-scores. They go into the z-test, the t-test, they go into the analysis of variance, they go into correlation and regression. They go into all of those things. And so they're really important. And you, get, you know also that the standard deviation and the variance are very closely related to one another. And the relationship is this, that the standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance, right? So if you want to get the standard deviation, you actually have to calculate the variance on the way. And then you just take one more step and get the square root, and then you have the standard deviation. So let me show you a little table I did in my, uh, my class the other day. By the way, I think I told you guys, if you are ever interested, I have a class that meets face-to-face -face on Tuesdays at 1. You can come to it. I mean, I know most of you either have jobs or you got something else going on at the time. But if you ever want to, we've got seats in there. And you can come. It's, it's in the LA building, and it's from 1 to 2.40 on Tuesdays. It's LA 019. 
And it's amazing for us Tuesdays from 1 to 240. And what shocks me about the LA is for a square building with just two hallways, how hard it is to find rooms. Um, okay. Let's take a quick look at this. I'm going to make a table here. And what we're going to put here is the, uh, I'm going to put whether something is a population or whether it is a sample. Because up to this point, it hasn't mattered. The mean, well, we have different symbols for the mean. You know, so the mean for the population is a mu, whereas the mean for a sample is either X with a bar over it or a big capital M. That's what the APA likes. So yeah. You need to know which one yes. Greek letters are for populations. And we have a handful of Greek letters that you got to know. So you got to know mu and you got to know sigma. You're eventually going to get to know alpha and beta. For what, uh, the mean, the sample mean. This is, yeah, that's all, these are both for the sample mean, but this is for the population. Uh, interestingly, this is a Greek lowercase m. So I think m is for mean, right? And the sigma that we're going to talk about here, that's a lowercase Greek s. I think for spread or for stand, you know, stand, standard deviation, okay? But let's do a little table here. Populations versus samples. And I'm going to draw a big square, see how big I can make my square. Okay. And then what we're going to do is the variance and the standard deviation. Okay. First off, let's get the symbols for each of these. Populations use Greek letters. The symbol for the variance in the population is like an O with a little curly Q on the top. And it has a squared. It's actually an S. It's a sigma. It's a lowercase sigma in Greek. Sigma squared is the population variance. The population standard deviation, on the hand, is just the sigma without the square. The sample variance is usually written as a lowercase s that's squared. Isn't that convenient? This is a Greek lowercase s. This is a Latin lowercase s. So I just have to remember, Greek and Latin. And then over here, the sample standard deviation is either a lowercase s, or the APA has us write a capital SD for standard deviation. Right? That's easy. But let's look at the formulas. Now there's one thing that's the same in all of these formulas, and it's what we call the sum of squares, which is short for sum of square deviations from the mean. I'll show it to you. Let's, let me just put that part up here. The sum of squares is equal to that. So what we have here, this is a capital sigma. It's a Greek letter. It's an S. It's the summation symbol. Now, please be aware that this sigma and this sigma have absolutely nothing to do with each other. They're totally, completely unrelated, which is frustrating because they're both sigmas. Okay, but that's lowercase and that's uppercase, all right? So the sum of squares is a, the sum where you get every single score and you find out how far it is from the mean. Now, I used a capital M because it's done the same for the population or the sample. So you can put a sigma, excuse me, you can put a mu in there or an X bar in there, or you can just use the M for the mean. So what you do is you get the mean for a set of scores you find out how far every score is from the mean. That's just called its deviation score. Then you square that number, so that's a square deviation from the mean. 
and then you sum them all up for the distribution. That's the sum of square deviations, and that's the SS. I'm going to show you more about that in a minute, okay? The reason I'm doing this is because I don't have a lot of room in these squares. And so I'm going to save a little space. The population variance is equal to SS over N. So what it is, is the sum of square deviations from the mean divided by n, which makes it the average square deviation from the mean. Because you guys know that to get an average, you add up the scores and you divide by the number of scores. Well, what we're adding up here is square deviations from the mean. Those are our scores. So it's the average square deviation from the mean. The standard deviation for the population is nothing more than the square root of that. So first you get the sum of squares, SS. Then you divide by N, and you have the population variance. Yay. Go one more step, take the square root of the number, and you'll have the sample, excuse me, the population standard deviation. Easy. Now let's come down to the sample part. Ready? The numerator is exactly the same. It's still the sum of squares on the top. Except this time, instead of dividing by n, exactly. By the way, you may have noticed I've gone to a lowercase n. That's because there's a convention to use a capital N when you're talking about the number of scores in a population and a lowercase n when you're talking about the number of scores in a sample. Except, of course, when we deal with chi-square or the analysis of variance where you have both a capital N and a lowercase n in the same formula, and they both refer to the sample. We're not going to deal a whole lot with that. Because one, one of them is dealing with subtotals and the other one with a grand total. But anyhow, sum of squares. And then, predictably, the standard deviation for the sample is simply that same thing. Just take the square root. Now, I hope you see that when you write the formula this way, it's not as busy, right? If you, you can do the sum of squares totally separately and then plug it into this stuff. So it, it's less, it's not as overwhelming. Let me show you. Let's go through and do some sum of squares stuff, okay? Let's get the population variance for a small data set. So I'm going to write some numbers down. Here's our data set. We got x. And I'll write uh, 3, 4, um, 1, 4, 3. So I got five numbers, right? Oh, no, wait. I'm gonna, I got to change one. I screwed up. Totally screwed up. Erase that data. I'm just going to write it in order so I don't mess up. There we go. Five numbers. One, one, two, three, three. Okay? Very simple data set. Very small. Let's get the population variance for these data. All right? Now, I find it easiest to write it down like a, like a spreadsheet table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little line here. I'm going to put X right there. And then I'm going to put the numbers down vertically. And I usually put the, the biggest numbers at the top and the smallest numbers at the bottom. So we have 3, 3, 2, 1, 1. Okay? And then I'll put another little line right here. The first thing that we need, let me, let me write the formula over here again. SS is equal to sum of X minus M squared. The first thing we need to do is get the mean. That's the first thing. So the mean is simply the sum of the scores over n, right? So let's get the sum of the scores. All we have to do is add them up. 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we got a mean of 10, right? Piece of cake. Then what we do to get the mean is we divide that number by the total number of scores that we have. And in this case, we have 5. So we come over here, and we have a sum of 10. We have 5 numbers, 10 divided by, whoops, 
10 divided by 5 is 2. That's easy, right? Okay. The second step then, there's the mean. We now have the mean. We're going to get the difference between every score on its own and the mean. That's called the deviation score. Deviation simply means how far away is it from something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come right here and I'm going to put in parentheses x minus 2. So this is x. I got five x scores. And for each one, I'm going to subtract 2. So 3 minus 2 is 1. 3 minus 2 again is 1. 2 minus 2 is 0. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And there's a negative 1. Okay? In case you're curious, the deviation scores will always add up to 0 because they are deviations from the mean. So they're going to always add up to 0. And you see that, you know. 1, 2, 1, 0. Okay. So the next thing we do, we've got x minus m. We just did that for each score. The next step is to square it. So I'm going to make it a third column here, x minus 2 squared. Okay? So I just take these numbers and I square them. 1 squared is 1, 1, 0. Negative 1 squared is positive 1, positive 1. Okay? So, I have now done, I got the mean, I got the deviation of each score from the mean, I squared that deviation from the mean, and now I'm going to sum that, those square deviations from the mean. So I come down here, and all I got to do is add them up. One, two, three, four. That's my sum of square deviations from the mean, or sum of squares, or just SS. It's four. Okay? Easy. So, let's go back and look at our uh, formulas right here. This number on the top, in every case, I'm going to replace it with a 4 for this data set, right? So let's do that. If I want this to be the population, I'll just write it here. Population variance, which is sigma squared. That's equal to SS over N. See? That's what I got right there. SS over N. And in this case, that's equal to 4 over 5. Because we had 5 scores. See? 1, 2, 3, 4, uh. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? 4 divided by 5 is 0.8. That is the population variance for these numbers. It assumes that these numbers represent a population. And so it's 0.8. OK. Very quickly, the, a good question to ask is 0.8 what? And what it is, is it means the average squared distance from the mean is 0.8 points, four-fifths of a point. That's the average squared distance from the mean. Okay. On the other hand, a lot of times square distances may not make much sense. There are certain things that people understand in squared units. You could talk about square feet, square miles, square inches. People know what those things mean. But squared IQ points or square dollars, people don't know what those mean. It's, and so that's why we take the standard deviation. So if we want the standard deviation, all we do, you know, we take the square, we just take the square root of that same thing. And I believe that the square root of 0.8 is around 0.89. You remember, for num maybe don't remember, but for numbers between 0 and 1, the square root's bigger than the number. Because think about it. If a number's between 0 and 1, it's a fraction, right? Like half. If you square a half, half of a half is a quarter. So it gets smaller when you square it. So if it gets smaller when you square it, then when you take the square root, it gets bigger. That, what, but that's only if it's between 0 and 1. Well, Bring a calculator. Yes, you can. Any kind of calculator except your phone. And, you know, I, I, 
at the beginning of the summer, I had a panic, like, what about people who have like TI-83s or 84s? Because those can do the variance in, this, in the standard deviation. You tap the numbers in, and I said, you know what? Anybody who is smart enough to know how to actually find the standard deviation function on those calculators, probably also smart enough to know how to do it anyhow. So I don't worry about it. <laughs> but that's why you can't use your phone, because, you know, I don't know if Siri actually does standard deviations, but... Uh, yeah, you could just Google it. It works. Um, anyhow, so you can use any kind of calculator except your phone. All right, those are the population numbers. So this is the population variance on the top, and this is the population standard deviation underneath. It's 0.8, and then we take the square root and get about 0.89. <gasps> it's exhausting, right? Okay, now let's do it a sample. It's not that hard. The only difference is that instead of dividing by n, we're dividing by n minus 1. That's easy. So let's come back here. So the sample variance, usually represented with s squared, is equal to ss over n minus 1. Well, ss is 4. Again, because the sum of squares is... is is the numerator on all of these. So we use it in every situation. Except this time we do n minus 1, so that's 5 minus 1, so that's 4 over 4, which is equal to 1. Ta-da! That's our answer. Notice that it's bigger than the 0.8 we got with the population. Okay, ready? Here's why it's bigger. I mean, aside from the obvious fact that we changed the denominator. But the reason why it's supposed to be bigger is because samples have a moral obligation to represent the populations that they come from. Samples are used to estimate population parameters. So when you get the sample variance, it's really a stand-in for trying to get the population variance. But the trick is, samples underrepresent the variability of the populations that they come from. I have a little analogy for this, and I think maybe it's in the book. But it's like this. If you think about the height of a small group of people, so let's just, just very quickly, uh, anybody here under 5'4"? How tall are you? 5'2"? Anybody here over 6 feet? How tall are you? Okay, so we go from 5'2 to 6 feet. It's a difference of 13 inches, right? Okay. That's a, that's a small range, but we're a small group of people. And so if we look at, uh, what, we're like nine or ten people in here, our range is not big. But if we then go to, what's the difference between the tallest and the shortest person at UVU, where we now have a group of 30,000 people? Uh, I don't know how to, but let, I'm sure there's somebody on campus who's 6'8". And... I believe there are actual grown-ups on campus who are like four feet, okay? That's a difference of over two and a half feet, right? So for us, it's, it's a difference of just over a foot. But on the campus, it's going to be over two and a half feet, right? Bigger group, more variation. And then one step from that is say, what's the difference between the tallest and shortest person in the world? And you're going to go from somebody who's like seven and a half feet, maybe eight feet, down to somebody, I think the shortest person in the world is like under two feet. And so that's a range of almost six feet, right? And so the variability in this group is about this big. The variability at UVU is about this big. The variability in the world, the population, is about this big. Samples underrepresent the variability of the populations that they come from. That's one of the reasons that we have to change the denominator here, and it bumps it up a little bit so that the sample is more likely going to accurately reflect the population. Now, I want to mention this is not an arbitrary choice. It's not they said, you know, this number's too small, let's just like subtract one. It has to be exactly one. And that's because the, the technical reason for it is because to get the uh, sample variance, you also had to estimate the mean on the way, and you used up one degree of freedom in the process. 
not a big deal. And, but you can also see, this is with an extraordinarily small sample, and this is not a big difference. And if the sample were like 500, the difference between dividing be between 500 and 499 is, is essentially negligible, right? So it's not going to make much difference after the sample gets any size. It only shows up when it's tiny, tiny samples. Um, we're going to do one more step, sample standard deviation. The sample standard deviation, or S, is just the square root of that number. So we get the square root of 4 over 5 minus 1. That's the square root of 4 over 4. That's the square root of 1, which coincidentally is 1. Now this is, of course, 0 and 1 are the only numbers where the square and the square root are the same as each other, right? Um, and this, the sample standard deviation, is about the closest thing we have to the average distance of each score from the mean. And remember, I said up here for the population variance, it actually is an average. It's the average squared distance from the mean. But you don't want to deal with squared distances. You normally want to deal with not squared distances. And so we usually use the sample standard deviation. So it's a modified average. You can't use exactly the average because it, it gets distorted in certain ways. It, this one comes up all the time. But there are also statistics that use the variance. Uh, something called R squared, or proportion of variance accounted for, uses it. The analysis of variance uses variance. So this shows up, and this shows up, depending on what you're doing. We have six minutes left. Um, there's going to be four more in the test, so we have to memorize. You have to memorize everything. Let me show you one other thing you got to memorize, aside from this formula, right? Oh, I got you. One more thing you got to memorize. This will be our last thing. Dum de dum de dum. Aside from z-scores, but the formula for z-scores is really easy. I'm not even going to bother going over it. Z-scores are easy. Look at the examples in the book. You do need to know areas associated with the bell curve. So here's a standard normal distribution. Normal refers to the bell curve shape. Standard means that it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. These are totally separate things. You know, you can have, I mean, this, this distribution can be standardized so that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. It's not normal, but it's standardized. Okay, so you can talk about z-scores. Similarly, you can have a bell curve like the IQ, where the mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. Yes. And so that's a normal curve. That's a normal distribution, but it's not standardized. And this is a standardized distribution that's not normal. because Those are separate things. This one is both normal because it's a bell curve and it's standardized because it has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. And what that does is that combination allows us to actually know what percentage of the distribution falls into each of these brackets. So this is 0, this is plus 1, plus 2, minus 1, minus 2, okay? This right here is 34% of the distribution. This right here is about 14% of the distribution. And if you know those two numbers, you can get the other four. Here's why. The distribution is symmetrical. So this has to add up to 50, right? 34 plus 14 is 48, which makes this 2%. And that's from 2 on out. And then it's symmetrical, so you just take these numbers and you put them over here, too. And that adds up to 100%. So if I ask you what percentage of the distribution, of the normal distribution, of the z distribution, is between minus 1 and plus 1, just to add up those two numbers, it's 68. If I ask you what proportion is between minus 2 and plus 2, it's 90, yeah, 
I've rounded off here so it adds up to 96. In reality, it's 95.4. But that's going to get you the right answer because the other choices are going to be like 67 and 20 and 100. You know, that'll get you the right answer. And then, just for what it's worth, I didn't go down to minus three or plus three. But okay, ready? Minus three and plus three goes to 99.7 percent of the entire distribution. I have that table in the book. So just be aware of that. You, and so you have to know these numbers, you have to memorize them, but you really only have to memorize these two in order to be able to get all the rest, the 34 and the 14. Okay? 34, 14, and you can get the rest of them. Our time is up.